Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Rev. Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Good evening and welcome to SBC Praise Minister's Bible Study. I'm Youth Pastor Sean Douglas. I'm Youth Pastor Makima Douglas. And we want to thank Pastor Duncans for giving us this opportunity to present a Bible study to you guys. We're excited about the Word of God tonight, and hopefully you'll be blessed. We'll be with you for the next three weeks presenting uh, on the four R's of a victorious 21. Again, the four R's of a victorious 2021. 20, the reset, the restart, the refocus and the readjust. Amen. Let us begin with the scripture reading. Our lessons will be coming from the book of Nehemiah. Tonight's lesson is going to begin in chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 2 through 4. And it reads that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Amen. Let's look to the Lord real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time that you have given us to be in your presence, to be in your will. Lord, we ask and pray right now, Lord, that you would illuminate this word, Father. That, Father, that you would give um, clarity. You would give understanding. And most of all, most of all Father, that you would, you, you would be seen through this word, Father. So we thank you right now for the time that you have given us to present uh, your word. So, Lord, help us. We decrease and allow you to increase. In the name of Jesus, help us, Lord, as we give this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, welcome to SBC Praise Ministers Bible Study. We want to welcome you. If you're home right now, we want you to invite you to come sit down, grab a cup of coffee, call a friend, let them know that we're on right now and that you can get a word from God. So join us as we uh, talk about the word of God tonight and just in the way of background, when we're talking about the book of Nehemiah, we're talking about the four R's of how do we reset, how do we refocus, how do we restart our life in 2021 to make it more victorious. Um, we looked at the book of Nehemiah. And the interesting thing about the book of Nehemiah, when it starts out, um, Nehemiah, we don't know much about him as a young person, but um, we pick up the story in chapter one where he's a, a young man and he's serving in the Persian king's court as the cupbearer. And it also tells us that Nehemiah's focus was on rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, but also reforming the spiritual commitment of God's chosen people. And you have to remember, Nehemiah was the third um, in the line who traveled um, to Israel, leading the third return of the Jewish people back from exile. So it's very important that we understand the background that we don't know everything about Nehemiah, but it starts out as him being a young man in the king's court, and he is the cupbearer. Amen. The theme tonight is reset. How do we reset? And what are we talking about resetting? We're talking about resetting your vision, your goals, your purpose. And how do we do that? The scripture says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. The first thing we need to understand if we're going to reset is we have to have a kingdom-building mind. We have to focus on God's things and not our things. Amen? Amen? So it's important that we do that. So our reset, our reset, our reset, our restart, our readjust, and our refocus starts with us first resetting our vision. The Bible says, where there's no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Proverbs 29 and 18. 
According to research done by the University of Scranton, 92% of the people who had a New Year's resolution or goal never, ever actually achieved that particular goal. And I asked myself, why didn't they achieve that goal? Why, why do people who make resolutions at the beginning of the New Year that, you know, I'm going to lose weight or uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, do better things in life, they set these goals, but somehow, some way, 92% of them never accomplish that particular goal they, they want to set out for. And my question is, is your vision, goals, and purpose about you or the kingdom? Again, are your visions, are your goals, are your purpose about you or God's kingdom? Habakkuk 2 and 2 says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that they may run who reads it. Write the vision. Make it plain. So who hears it, who sees it, can run, who reads it, can run with it. Research done by Edwin and Locke and Gary Latham found that, that when people follow these two principles, these, these two principles, setting Pacific goals and challenge, excuse me, setting Pacific and challenging goals, writing them down, it led to higher performance 90% of the time. So people who set goals, who have, who have a vision, and they write it down, 90% of the time, they, they have a higher performance. And this just by way of talking about vision, uh, me and my wife, we have something at our house, we have a vision board that we do every at the beginning of every year, uh, we try to write down what we want to see God do in our life. And I want to share with you one of the things that we put on the board that for this year that we wanted to do. Uh, one of the goals that we had uh, for, for ministry in our life was to develop five new leaders in our youth ministry that were not the same people that we already had in ministry. So we wanted to get out five new people to come and be a part of the youth ministry, but also train them to be leaders. That was our goal. And it's important to understand that it wasn't about us. It wasn't about what we wanted, what we thought was good. It was about bettering the ministry. It wasn't about me. It was about the kingdom. And we have to understand something. When we want to reset ourselves, if we want to reset in 2021, we have to focus on our vision. What are our plans? What are our goals? What are our objectives? And it's important to understand that that, that verse that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That, that's important for, for anybody in every walk of life. You need to reset to thinking that I'm going to seek God's kingdom first, and then he's going to add all those other things that I need to me. Amen. I, I wanted to add this point because I know you brought up our vision board, and I've heard so many stories about people creating vision boards and vision boards parties. It's okay to go back and make adjustments. It's okay to consider what we're talking about tonight. Um, reflecting on what you've already written down and make sure that, you know, we align this with it. Amen. Amen. And I, I gotta tell you something, to be honest, um, when we first started doing this, we did this the first year that we did it. We wrote down our, our, all, our all our plans for, for, for the new year when we first started out doing a vision board. And we put scriptures behind everything that we did. So if we said that we want to, uh, you know, save $5,000 for the year or whatever, we put a scripture to that. We put God to that. Uh, we, we added something where God was going to be a part of everything that we said we were going to do for that year. And believe it or not, we accomplished almost everything yeah. on that list that year. That we, we said, God, we want this God, we need this God. And we went, we researched, and we put scriptures to it. So it's important when you, when we talk about vision, Habakkuk made it very clear. God said, write it out, write it, you know, the vision. Specifically. Right? Yes. Write down the vision. It's so important that you write God's vision down and then you execute it through his word. And God's vision will include the provision. Understand that. God's vision for your life will include the provision for your life also. So you don't have to worry about, you know, whether God's going to do it or how he's going to do it. He is Jehovah Jireh. God is our provider. So whatever you write down, and it's, it's God-centered and it's God-focused, God's going to make a way for it to happen to come to pass. Jeremiah 29 and 11, this is one of my favorite scriptures that I use all the time in youth ministry. Is It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It's a good one. 
Yeah, it is. I, I, I love. I, and when I first discovered that scripture as a young man, I took it to heart, and and I always wanted to live by this particular principle to know that God is thinking about me. And you have to understand, God is thinking about you. No matter where you are, whether you're sitting at your kitchen table, you're in the dining room, you're in your living room, you're in your bathroom, whether you're in your car, God has his mind on you and the plans that he has for your life. Plans, the vision, the purpose for your life. To prosper you, the grace and the mercy that you get, the good health. He wants to make sure that you have a life that's more abundant. So it's very important that you know that God is thinking of you. The hope, he wants to give you a hope. Faith, the hope that we have is it, so important. And then a future, a life that is blessed, that's fulfilled. You got, I, I, you looking over here, boy. She's stirring up the gift. <laughs> um, we should be able to testify about the goodness of the Lord when we reflect on these things. So many people were like, 2020, and you know, we wanted it to go away. And, and But we started off saying, 2020, new vision. So we are in 2020, 20. the first year of new vision. Yes. So I'm excited that there's a plan. There's already a plan. Yes. So like I said before, if you want to start out the new year right, the first thing you have to do is reset. And we talked about it, resetting your vision. Re resetting your vision about God and what he wants to do in your life is so important. Nehemiah chapter 1 verses 2 and 4, we read it before, but we're going to read it one more time and you're hearing. Then Hananiah, one of the brethren, came and he and certain men of Judah and asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left, in, to, left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates there are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This is Nehemiah after he hears about the destruction and the despair of his people. How do I reset my vision? Nehemiah asks questions concerning God's people. It's so important that we understand that when we reset our, our purpose, our vision, that our concern is not about us, it's about others. It, it, you know, it, sometimes we can be selfish in our living and our thinking, um, um, the way we go about doing things in life, and sometimes it, it can be all about us, the hustle and bustle of life, of the regrets of, of, of not... Of, my problems, my issues, yes, my kids. Yes. And we get caught up in it and we don't think about others. But Nehemiah had a mind to ask his brethren what was going on with the people back in Jerusalem. And him hearing that, there, there was also a, a, you know, a, a care with that. So besides the concern, there was a care about the people. And sometimes, again, as Christians, as believers, we can get caught up in everyday life, uh, the struggles of what's going on. And we forget about the people who are suffering and hurting. It's interesting right now that we're in a place in 2021 where we, we got to talk about the COVID relief and we got to talk about, you know, financial economic relief. We got to talk about people in food lines, people losing their jobs. Displaced with housing. Yes. And there's so many issues and concerns going on. But what is the church doing? Mm -hmm. What are the men and women of God doing about those concerns? Nehemiah learns of the people's distress and despair, the great affliction and reproach. He literally begins to cry. His pain can be seen through his expression of grief. He learns about God's health left in ruins, broken down, and burned. And sometimes our lives, as men and women of God, can reflect that same place where we see these people in Jerusalem. That our lives are, you know, broken down. Busted, burnt, bruised, ashamed, terrified, embarrassed, alone, separated, all over the place, scattered. That's where they were in Jerusalem. And you got to remember that they didn't get there but because of, you know, uh, they were just, you know, it just happened to happen. No. God had to place them in this place because of their disobedience. Because they did not want to hear what God had to say to them about the vision he had for their life. 
So it's so important that we understand that there are many people out here that are hurting, that are discouraged, that, that are embarrassed. But we as believers have to have a mindset to reset our vision, to think about others and the concern and care that we have for them. But Jesus said in John 10 and 10, the thief come not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. Jesus said, I, I don't want you to live in these circumstances. I don't want you to live your life from day to day, paycheck to paycheck, circumstance to circumstance, problem to problem. I want you to understand that I came to give you life and not just any ordinary life, an abundant life. A life of more than enough. A more than enough to what? To, that I may be a witness, that I may be a testimony to someone else to give them a hope, to give them a, 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 a new beginning. And it's so important as Christians, as we go through this daily life, if we want to reset our vision for 2021, it's not about us. It's about those hurting. It's about those who are, who are out there suffering. And we need to give them a word that will encourage them and help them. Vision and purpose and goals are a burden. It takes heart. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak. Nehemiah, during this particular time, and I'm thinking about Nehemiah in his life, and I'm thinking about why didn't he know that the people were hurting already? Why did he have to ask his brother about the concerns of the people who were left in exile. Was he concerned that just being the cupbearer for the king was enough? And that, you know, he, he had his own problems, his own circumstances, his own things that he had to deal with. But why was Nehemiah not in tune with what was going on with the common, ordinary people, that, that, that their struggles, their pains? Because you gotta remember, they're in Jerusalem. This is God's house. It's in shambles. It's ruined. It's burned. It's broken. It's busted. It sounds, it sounds like what we're dealing with today in America. What we're dealing with in society. We have people who are bruised and busted and broken. Crumbling. The walls were crumbling down. People are walking every day through the same stuff. Through the same mess. Looking at the walls destroyed. Looking at lives destroyed. And doing nothing. No vision. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. And right now, Nehemiah is going through a phase where he's resetting his vision so now that the people can be changed. Psalms 42 and 1 says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth, panteth my soul after you, God. It's a heart thing. It's not a mind thing. It's about where your heart is. And God wants to know that your heart is in the right place. When you reset, reset your vision to God's purpose. He said, seek ye first the kingdom. And he's going to add everything else done to you. Set your heart on God's purpose, on God's vision, on God's mission. I guarantee you, you'll be blessed. Nehemiah does three things in the moment that he, he begins to weep. And the three things that he does, he, and the Bible says that when he heard the news, that first he began to cry, he began to weep. But then after that, they said he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. That's what he did after he heard the news about the people being utterly just, just ashamed, embarrassed, broken down, beaten down, the walls torn down, burned in Jerusalem, God's house in shambles. He hears it. He begins to weep, but after he weeps, he says, I began to mourn. And mourning is, in definition, is regret or a deep remorse. He has a deep remorse or regret about what's going on with the people of God and the house of God. And in order for you to understand how to reset your vision for 2021, you got to have that same regret. Remorse, that pain, that suffering, you have to feel it in order to reach other people. And Nehemiah has that. And we see that in the scripture. What do we mourn or regret? Nehemiah hears the plight of the people in God's house and he mourns. We talked about that. As Christians, sometimes we have regrets, moments of doubt, 
a big decision. But thank God we have a Savior. Thank God we have a deliverer. Thank God that we have a, a way maker. Matthew 11, 28 and 29 says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I will, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. You'll find rest for your soul. Come to Jesus. Amen. He can give you the rest that you need. He can give you the peace that you need. He can give you the mind. If your mind is wondering, he is a mind regulator. So understand this, that if you want to reset your vision in 2021, you got to have a mind that is kingdom focused. And understand, it's going to take concern and care, but also you having a come to Jesus moment to say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you with everything I have. We're going to break down a little more of this process that he started going through after he started mourning. So I'm going to pick up on verse 4 again. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Right here when he says, when I heard these words. Sometimes you got to ask. I heard a comedian say, you know, it's rude if you respond to this question. They say, how you doing? They don't expect you to answer. But we need to take the time to ask and listen. There's a difference. There's a difference between just hearing and listening. He says, I heard these words. Anyone can hear. You have to care enough to ask what's going on in the lives of people and listen to hear with an intent to help and not hurt. Amen. If Amen. you can't help me, don't hurt me. Amen. It's the least you can do. Amen. Ephesians 4, 1 through 8, and this is a long scripture, but I, again, and, and us getting our minds renewed and transformed, the best tool is the word of God. So it's only eight verses. I'll skip a bit. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. This is a universal thing. The world is going through this. Not just America, the world is experiencing this trauma. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Amen, amen. God will give us what we need during this process. He will give us what he needs. I sat down. I could read up, repeat up here because I had to catch myself because there are times where you have to tell yourself, sit down, sit down, sit down. Stop, pause, reflect, take inventory, take an assessment. Are you being a good leader? Are you being a good servant? First Corinthians 4 and 1 says, Let a man regard us in this matter as servants of Christ and stewards over the mysteries of God. Another one. John 1, John 15. John 15. <laughs> oh, I'm glad that's <laughs> You are my friends. This is Jesus talking. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. I'm trying to, with studying, we have to study and weigh the word against the word and so you can get the principle he's trying to teach. So as much as Jesus refers to us as servants, he wants us to understand we're friends and being obedient. No longer do I call you servants. He's given us some insight into how he sees us and he wants us to envision ourselves when we're doing these things. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not understand what his master is doing. 
but I have called you friends. Because everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me. Stop right there. Amen. We think we choose him. We decided to be on this journey. Correction. Amen. You did not choose me. We got to remember that. But I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. He'll take care of all those other things, but we got to put it in order. Can I, can I make a plan again? Help. He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Yeah. One God. So I did a little poll with our uh, chosen ministry, which is our millennials, ages 13, 18 to 35. 18 to 35. And I asked this question to challenge them. I said, what makes a good leader? A good leader. These are their answers. Clarity, empathy, respect, communication, gratitude, decisiveness, accountability, someone who listens to the problems and not quick to answer, sympathy, empathy for others, someone who practices what they preach. They are an example in conduct, consistent, honest, and transparent. Wow. Transparent. Do you know how much people get done and in our time that we spend with folks, if we were consistent, honest, transparent, this is three, let alone the rest. We people need help. Resetting, it's not easy. What do we say? Almost 90% fail and try to change. 92%. 92% who said New Year's resolutions never get them done, never accomplish that New Year's resolution because they don't write it down and they're not clear and specific about what they want to accomplish. So this is an example, I, I'm, I'm a teacher, and uh, this is what I taught my kids about being a, a leader. They used to argue and fight over who's the line leader. Then okay, I said, well, you know what, then we're gonna have a line leader and a, and a leader at the end of the line. They would fight over that. Then the solution ended up being, I said, you know what? Everyone's a leader. They were baffled. I said, you're the leader yourself. Never had that problem again. And I could have taken any one of those 18 to 20-something children and allowed them to lead a line with however many people behind them. That's a mindset that we have to have in doing this. People are following us. Yes. Behind us, in the middle, wherever we go. And you don't have to have a title to be a leader. Your title came when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Amen. Lord. Amen. Say that again. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. Your title came. And that just made you a brother or sister in the Lord. That scripture. That scripture. Here's another one. Luke 22, chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. But you are not like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who is at the table, this is Jesus, what he said to his disciples when they were arguing about who's the best in the kingdom, who's going to be first, who's going to be last. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? This is what Jesus said. But I am among you as one who serves. And he is our example. So one of the other things that Nehemiah did after he sat out, part of his morning process is he let himself feel it. Sometimes we want so bad, you know, we don't want to go through nothing. I don't want, I don't want to deal with my problems. I don't want to hear about anybody else's problems because I have enough. But there's something about putting someone before you. Taking your mind off of your problems and focusing on someone else. And before you know it, yours just line up and be gone. Someone always has it worse. But the bottom line is, it's many members but one body. And if I hurt, you should hurt. And if you don't know I'm hurting, sometimes it's because you didn't ask. Amen. And if you didn't ask, sometimes it's because you don't want to know. Because you don't want to feel it. And can I add something here? Oh, while we're studying the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, as you begin to read through in verses 2 through 4, um, the, his brother tells him about what's going on. He begins to weep and mourn. And, and, I, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier about Nehemiah, that he did not understand. Now, mind you, 
He's in a position of power. He's in a, a position of privilege. And through that position of privilege, he forgot about the people who were in exile. He forgot about their suffering. He forgot about what they were going through at that particular time. And his brother just brought it back to his remembrance about where the people were and what the conditions were where they were living. And so many times that we see ourselves in this world right now, there are so many people out here, like I said, in the food lines that are hungry, that, that, are, that can't make their bills, you know, they're getting kicked out of their house, they can't pay their mortgage. We have to understand that we have to feel a certain concern about people who are hurting, who are discouraged, who are, who are, de who are suffering through depression and anxiety and going through all these different things that we have to recognize and understand it's not about us, it's about God's kingdom. So he identified with what was going on and he connected. We need to really work on connecting. And Nehemiah had to empathize, be accountable, listen, slow to answer. These are actually points from what the millennials said will make a good leader. Amen. And Nehemiah went through the process. It's okay. We have to go through the process. It's okay. Because we're at reset. Practice what you preach. Be honest. Be transparent. And be an example in conduct. He wasn't there. Wait. He wasn't there. He had to deal with, you know, we can't be everywhere. You can't do everything. You miss the mark sometimes. That's part of the process of mourning. The conviction. The, the repentance. The let me fix it. Let me fix it again. This is a process where God understands. You mess it up, you fix it up. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to give us that unction, that conviction, the word, the soundness, so that we don't be disqualified. Amen. And we don't miss out on anyone. So he had to imagine how they must have felt and what they had gone through. And when he had gotten to that point, he realized, I need to fast and pray. That was the next thing he did. He decided to fast and pray before God of heaven. Some things, as it relates to change and deliverance, you might have to fast and pray. I'm going to skip ahead because for time's sake, and if we don't get to all these points, we will, they will overlap in the next couple of weeks. But if I had to sum all this up, we have to beat our flesh into subjection. There are some things that have been habitual. Um, it might be oppressive spirit. It may be a demonic presence. It may, it, it, the problem is, it's a problem. But once you realize that, we have tools to get through it. And part of fast, if you understand, that you put your body in subjection, you deny some food. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff is going to come up. Attitudes, mindsets, issues, etc. But <clears throat> Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 17, um, verses 19 through 21, the disciples, they were out together, and there was a man that brought his son, and his son was having seizures, and he was being tormented by a demonic spirit. And Jesus had to step in because the disciples couldn't really help. And privately, they went aside and asked Jesus, why, why couldn't we help the man? Why did you have to step in and deliver this man? And he had said to them, I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would be moved. Nothing would be impossible. Now, this is a scripture that is omitted from some, um, some text, which is verse 21, which says, but the only way to force out that kind of demon is by praying and going without eating. Yeah. And a lot of times people think it's spooky when we talk about spiritual things, but we're always in a spiritual battle, wrestling with your flesh and your spirit. They're at war at all times. But this is a, a personal experience. So I would encourage you that you do take the time to fast and pray. You do take the time to find out what is God's vision for your life. He said he has one and plans. And if you seek him first and his kingdom and his righteousness, start there. 
then all the other things will be added unto you. He said the greatest thing that we could have is we would love our neighbor as ourselves. So um, I'm going to stop right couple, here. I think we got a couple more slides. One. But for time's sake, the, 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 the this last is another one. paraphrase of it as well. Okay. Can you go to the last one? Yeah. That, this, this will give us just a just the final, how do we reset our vision, our goals, and purpose for 2021? Here's what we need to look at, the reset. Focus on God's kingdom. Not my will, but thy will be done. Focus on God's kingdom. Second thing, let concern and care drive you. Concern and care for what? Not myself, but for others. Let's get a mind of serving other people. Seek ye first the kingdom. Write the vision down. It's important. Details are important. What God has for you, no man can hinder. He opens doors no man can close and closes doors no man can open. So you got to understand what God has for you is for you. And last, fast and pray, then speak. That's what Nehemiah did. After he wept and mourned, he fast and prayed. And then he spoke to God. Then he prayed to God. So our, your homework for next week, because we'll be with you for the next three weeks going through this, the reset uh, of your vision, but also some other, the, the other, the restart, the refocus. Your homework. Review chapter one of Nehemiah. Read that this week. Read chapter one. So important. But also, go to chapter two, because next week we'll be dealing with chapter two of Nehemiah. So again, your homework, review chapter one and read chapter two. Amen. And we want to thank you well, for, for tuning in and joining us tonight. We, we want to say God bless you. And we want to share with a prayer with you. My wife, can you, can you lead us out in prayer? Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to focus on you and your plan and your will for our life. I pray that you carry us throughout the day and the remainder of the week. You strengthen our families, strengthen our mind, encourage our hearts, and deliver us from evil. I thank you for your blessings and your power. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Hide the word in our heart that we may not sin against you. Amen.